All right. Hello, everybody, and welcome back to the <laughs> welcome back to the Green Bank Science Lunch Talk series. Um, this week, um, we have Bren Gregory, who is actually a uh, data analyst here with us at Green Bank, and today she's going to be talking with us about some of um, her work and work in the past um, about women in STEM. Um, an ethnographic study. So please, when you're ready, Bren, enlighten us. Sure. Um, so I will start with what is an ethnography. Not everybody may be familiar with that, um, but that's more of a qualitative study of a group of people. Um, so in my career, I've obviously am now working at the Green Bank Observatory and I've been a woman in STEM for most of my school career. Uh, and I also had the unique experience of taking anthropology courses in my undergraduate. And so I found myself extremely interested in um, what I was seeing for myself and also my colleagues and peers in the STEM fields. Um, and I had the unique position where I was given tools, uh, anthropological tools to understand what I was seeing. Um, so I would like to start off with just saying that, and that's sort of where this research came from, was noticing that I was one of three women in a room of 20 people in higher level physics courses and trying to understand why I was seeing that and the feelings that I was feeling when I was in that room. So I'll go on to the next slide. So some important terms to know as we go through this presentation, STEM is uh, science, technology, engineering, and math fields. However, this kind of categorization can cover a lot of different sciences. So I and many others have broken up some of these sciences into two different subsections. LSPs, which are life sciences, psychology, and social sciences. Um, this excludes economics and GEMPs. So those are the geosciences, engineering, math, computer science, and physical sciences. Um, so it's a bit easier to understand this as uh, the amount of math that goes into these sciences that can oftentimes uh, be a contributing factor in some of the research I was looking at. So how uh, I'm gonna go through this presentation, we'll start with a literature review, understanding the background um, and some of the history of research that's already been done. Then we'll move into theoretical frameworks that I employed and used to understand what I was seeing, my method, uh, some quotes from my, from my participants, my findings and the steps forward. Um, so I would like to start with looking at the early years of education through middle school. Um, many studies have shown that girls do not consistently perform worse on standardized math tests. Uh, so oftentimes these studies would have younger children take these standardized math tests uh, to try and see a difference between the genders. Um, here I'm focusing on uh, men and women. There's a lot, there's not as much research on non-binary non -binary and the spectrum of genders. However, that research is starting to become more prevalent. So, so Fryer and Levitt in 2010 and Punner and Parrott in 2008 uh, studied groups of American school children who started kindergarten in 1998. And Fryer and Levitt found that boys and girls enter school with similar math scores. Uh, they found that the male advantage appears by spring of first grade though. So even though these children are entering school um, with no apparent advantage, an advantage starts to appear. But by the end of fifth grade, uh, you do see a significant amount of an advantage skewing towards the boys. Now, we are focusing on the US in this research, uh, literature review and research. I was gonna be conducting my research in the United States. And the way that a culture is set up and their cultural beliefs and values plays a large role in how we develop our sense of self. So I knew that looking at only US studies was gonna be best for my understanding of what was happening um, before I talked to the women that I talked to. Uh, so there is evidence that shows that major gender differences in math scores are concentrated at the top distribution of scores. So this is important for us to look at when thinking in the long run, because oftentimes children who do better in certain courses are going to think about following those courses as a career path. So what we're seeing is the beginning of this gender disparity um, and difference between men and women 
in STEM starting at a very young age. Uh, if these children are gonna go on to study STEM, we already have this difference appearing. And this is also a very impressionable time for kids. Uh, middle school early and er the early years is when children start to form their belief systems. It's when their ideas of how the world works and how they interact with the world is solidified and is influenced by a large number of factors. There's been a lot of research on how language influences the way uh, you view the world around you and many other factors like that. So that's important to keep in mind as we move through our kind of timeline of schooling uh, for women in STEM. So next we'll move to middle school and high school. Here's where we start to see gender differences in math scores. And I'm, I focused on math scores uh, because when I talked to my participants um, and also from my own experience, math was sort of the defining factor in some of these experiences they were having. That was what they call math anxiety. Um, and that was what was preventing some students from going into more math heavy fields was they felt like they couldn't do math. Um, so I did focus on some math scores here. And once you see those math scores stabilize the difference in genders, they do not reverse. Many studies have looked into this, including Hyde et al. in 2008 and Pope and Snyder in 2010. And understanding the school system in the United States helps provide us some context for this stabilization. So in high school, it was found that girls are less likely to take more advanced math and science courses. In high school, it's when you're first able to really choose your classes. You're able to decide, oh, I wanna take statistics instead of pre-calculus within reason. Um, and that's when we start to see this difference in girls deciding to not take these uh, math heavy courses. Uh, so a study in 2003 found that girls were indeed likely, less likely to participate in science and engineering courses. And because the US school system is standardized, we actually have, in some cases, we actually have some great resources to look at the gender difference in classes taken. So US Advanced Placement, AP exams, provide meaningful data on the number of girls versus boys taking science and math APs. Uh, and it has been found, I'll show in a second, that considerably fewer girls take AP courses in math, science, computer science, and math intensive sciences. Now, there are other factors that play a role into the decision to take AP courses about whether APs are either, even offered at your school, um, whether certain sciences are offered. I know in my school, computer science was not offered as an AP, and that oftentimes has to deal with where you grow up and your socioeconomic background. So again, there's other uh, things that play a role in your decision to, make these uh, to take these classes as, young, as a young child. Um, and that's important to keep in mind as you're moving th forward understanding this. So here we can see some of the gender differences in selected US STEM advanced placement uh, test taking. So um, it's quite a few numbers thrown up here, but basically the general idea is that fewer women uh, decide to take these AP exams. And when they do take the AP exams, they consistently in some uh, courses do not score as high as men do in these exams. So these, this source is from uh, the College Board in 2016. Um, and here you can see all the different subject areas that are considered those GEMP classes. Then we move on to higher education. So here I'm talking, when I talk about higher education, I am talking strictly about college, uh, not about graduate school, simply because I was going to be talking to college age students. Yes, graduate school was uh, a future plan for some of this, the women I talked to, but in the current moment, the higher education they were experiencing was indeed college. So there is a noticeable difference between the number of women in LPS fields, again, those life science fields, and GEMP fields. In 2014, women received only 27% of bachelor's degrees in GEMP fields. So you do see more women in, in fields such as biology, um, but in those GEMP fields, we were seeing fewer women get bachelor's degrees. And this varies from year to year, um, and there's many influences that may change that. But overall, the trend remains the same. There are less women than men in these fields. Now, looking uh, at doctoral degrees earned by women, I, I found this important to mention. 
This is a uh, graph of the percent of women in certain doctoral degrees from 1968 to 2018. So we are seeing a consistent increase of women in doctoral degrees. However, um, you'll notice that the bi biology has spiked uh, significantly and is over 50% women are receiving doctoral degrees in biology. But those other GEMPs are still lower below 50%. And your it is important to realize that when you're looking at this, you're not just thinking about the difference between men and women receiving doctoral degrees. You need to understand the socioeconomic background of these people who are receiving degrees. And then you also need to understand um, how race plays a role in this as well. So in, in, as of 2019, only 22 black women hold PhDs in astronomy or related fields. And there's quite a bit of really interesting and important research on how the co combination of gender and race plays a role on whether you will proceed to receive a, a PhD in a GEMP field. But I'll talk about that a little bit later. So looking at STEM occupations, according to the NSF's 2013 National Survey of College Graduates, only 36% of women with a bachelor's degree or higher in the STEM field actually worked full time in STEM jobs. Now this has changed over time. These numbers are a bit older, as I mentioned earlier, because I did do this research in, a, in the year of 2016. So these numbers have changed slightly. But women are more likely than men to work at education and health related jobs. This is something that's been found. So even if you do receive a GEMP uh, degree, women are more likely than men to work in education and health related jobs. And this was something that I did see in my research as well. So a, an NSF survey asked, how related is your job to your highest degree? And I found this to be more valuable to my research than just numbers. I wanted to see the responses of a larger portion of people about how related their degree actually was to their job. And we actually don't see that much of a difference between men and women. 82.2% um, of men and 80.5% of women with their highest degrees in STEM stated that their jobs are closely related to the degree. Um, so if you go on to get a STEM degree, you're most likely going to work in a field or a job that is closely related to what you studied. But then we start to see an opting out narrative in the background literature. So this highlights the uh, work and family conflicts that people often face. Uh, work isn't your entire life and uh, other portions of your life will come into play. So we see a large portion of women leaving STEM occupations. There's an, uh, many studies showing that a lack of retention of women in STEM fields is actually due to leaving for childcare. Um, there's also evidence of chilly climates, which was coined by Hunt in 2016 to um, explain reasons why women are more likely to leave jobs that are heavily male. And I'll talk about that more in just a moment. So next, I wanna talk about the leaky pipeline. Uh, this is a term that I employed quite a bit during my research and other people looking into this field have employed a lot. So the leaky pipeline refers to the loss of women from STEM jobs in academia at critical points in their career. So some of these points may be selection, promotion, retention. And while some people do use it to understand the education process, I really did employ this to understand the full education process of women in STEM from the first day of kindergarten all the way to when they graduated college. I thought of it as just a one long pipeline. And um, many have countered this model. It is rather simplistic to understand, uh, to use, and it doesn't take into account other barriers such, such as socioeconomic and racial disparities. Um, but in my work, it was easy to employ this. Now, the other model is considered a gender filter model in which filters are based on implicit biases that our cultural hegemony has instilled with us without even realizing. Um, so just growing up in the world that you grew up, you have certain beliefs that are instilled in you and those may be unconscious. You may not even know that you have that belief in you, but it is still there. Um, so this gender filter model employs these implicit biases to help explain why there are leaks in the pipeline. 
So to explain this better, what I'll do is I will bring up a study actually from a paper that was released in 2019. And I believe this study is a really good example of understanding how implicit bias affects uh, STEM and in occupation. So here we have a study, I'll explain the graph in a second, but here we have a study that looked at um, a group of behavioral scientists, well, so a group of behavioral scientists in France looked at a French committee's selection process for promotion. And this was in many different STEM fields. You can see uh, all of the STEM fields up on that screen. And they wanted to shed light on the role that implicit bi bias plays on deciding uh, the future of professional female scientists. So every member of the National Committee for Scientific Research, um, which is a collective body that includes 40 specialized committees and plays a very large role in French science, was invited to take part in this study. They were told it would look at whether the committee's promotions decisions were biased against women or not um, to determine if that was true. And half of the members decided to participate. So, these members were, were asked uh, to complete a survey called an IAT. So this helps determine your unconscious bias. It is a quick uh, association sort of game. I wouldn't, game isn't the best word, but it, it tests your quick associations. And so here they used association measuring between the concepts male, female, science, and liberal arts. Words representing each of those concepts would flash across a computer screen and scientists had to categorize them very quickly, too quickly for you to think about it. Um, this method is controversial. So uh, like many methods where there isn't much basis um, in it, you should take it with a grain of salt, but it was a good way to measure the unconscious bi bias versus a, a, a um, questionnaire where the conscious bias could be evaluated. So in that questionnaire, people were asked uh, why they think under, women are underrepresented in STEM. Is it because they're discriminated against? Is it because familial duties uh, burden their time? And many questions like this. So looking at the combination of these two uh, questionnaire and IAT study, the, the important thing to know is that uh, and you can see it here on, on this graph at the bottom, that the study was a two-year program. So the study provided information saying, hey, we're looking at gender bias in your selection uh, committee. This is what we're doing. This is how we'll do it. So they completed the IAT test in the questionnaire. They then the next year did not remind participants that they were completing a study, but they still completed the questionnaire. Um, and in that year, second year, the selection decisions actually showed that when you are consciously thinking about implicit bias, you are more likely to question that imp implicit bias and say, okay, we need to be hiring more women because we were thinking this before and in fact that is incorrect and that these women do deserve to be in these positions. But in the second year, that, that went away. They weren't reminded to check their implicit bias and the numerical trend of hiring women went down. So what you're seeing here is all those different, um, all of those different fields, and that red line represents gender parity. So where you would expect for uh, the break between men and women to be, and the only one you can see that crosses that red line is cultures and societies. Um, so what we're seeing here is that the st at, in STEM there was not that equal balance that you would expect to see. Now, that's a long way to say that implicit biases do play a very large role in our decision making, whether we think about it or not. And that was extremely important in my research as I was talking to the, these women I was talking to and their, not only their thoughts, but the thoughts of the peers around them. Um, so now we're gonna look a little bit into impacts of stereotypes on educational choices. So studies have been looking about students' beliefs um, and the effects of those on their choices for a really long time. Eccles and Jacobs found that children's estimates of their own ability in math and their belief that math is valuable affected their future math performance. So if a student thought that math was important, that they were good at math, they were more likely to do well in math. 
And we see these stereotypes begin extremely early in a child's career. Um, so Svevnik et al. 2011 reported that second grade, by second grade, both boys and girls had implicit biases and explicit stereotypes associating math with the category males. So when these children were thinking about math, they immediately associated it with boys. And then it also found that girls were associating reading with themselves. Now, there's a, a theory here that I mentioned, incremental theory or growth theory, that can be employed and that I employ to understand this sort of mindset effect on ability. So basically what it was saying was if a child believes that they can't do it, they won't be able to do it. If they are taught that they can do it and if they think they can do it, then they are more likely to be able to achieve what they've set out to, put, to do. Um, and I, it's been shown that uh, intervention can help affect that as well. So an experiment found that a high schooler what, who was seen as a role mo model to a group of sixth graders told those sixth graders before math tests that their performance was due to how much effort they put into studying. And so once they were, the children were told this, the scores increased for girls, but not for boys. Girls with an intervention of that mentor scored 5% higher than they would have, um, but without that intervention scored 20% lower than was expected. So it's shown, it has been shown that mentoring can make a huge impact on a student's life, especially for young girls. And families' contributions uh, of stereotypes also play a huge role. Um, if mothers held gendered stereotypes, then the children, their uh, daughters, were not likely to do well in their classes. Um, and these parental expectations contribute to this gender gap in math tests. If, you ha if these girls have a parent employed in STEM, it increased the child's probability of majoring and working in STEM for by 10 to 17%. So I kept that in mind when I was doing my research and made sure to ask uh, my participants what their parents did, um, because I knew that was gonna play a big role in understanding what my participants were thinking about their experiences. Teachers also contribute to math gender stereotypes. Um, here we're also thinking of science gender stereotypes. And it's been sh shown multiple times, um, even in the 1970s, that teachers spent more time informally and formally teaching boys math than they spent on girls. Um, and again, this was important for me to think about in doing my own research. Culture also plays a large role in understanding stereotypes. Uh, these stereotypes don't come from mid, like out of thin air, they do come from a place and every place has culture. So each culture is going to create different gender stereotypes. And again, looking at the United States, the gender stereotypes uh, that one of them that was mentioned by one of my participants actually mentioned toys. Um, you don't really think of toys as culture, but you can because it's influenced by culture. And she mentioned that the toys that she played with as a child did not match uh, the toys that her male peers were playing with um, and that the male to the boy toys that were blue and were science kits did not match to the easy bake oven that she was given. Um, and I remember that quote stood out to me pretty significantly. Uh, role models play a huge role in understanding gender stereotypes as well. Um, and I saw that in my own research, which I'll talk about. But Batia et al. 2015 found that exposure to female STEM teachers in high school increased the probability that female students would major in STEM in college. Once in college, it was found that female students are more likely to pursue STEM majors if they've had a, a female faculty. And another study found that women were less likely to major in STEM fields at research intensive institutions. So if it was an institution that was focused on research, women were less likely to want to major in STEM fields. However, this could be moderated if there were more female uh, graduate students present. So again, we're already seeing just in the back, in the research and the literature review, that that plays a huge role in having, mentoring plays a huge role in proceeding in STEM careers. So again, talking about the peer influences in STEM, uh, the way students talk about STEM to each other plays a large role in the perception of said fields. 
And feelings of social isolation play a large role in the retention of women in STEM fields. So again, these were all uh, literature reviews and previous research that I was using to understand what I thought I would be seeing. So forming close supportive bonds with other students in their fields may be vital in retention. I kept that in my mind. And in adolescent studies, it's been shown that peers are not as supportive of the pursuit of STEM careers. And I also kept that in the back of my mind to see if I was going to see responses like that. So now that I've gone past some of the previous research that's been done and that I was going to use to kind of understand where I was moving forward, I'm gonna talk a little bit about the theoretical frameworks that I employed. So gender order theory um, is the way in which institutional structures uh, known as gender regimes and individual identities intersect to produce the social arrangements that mean one gender can dominate another politically, socially, and economically. I also knew that I was going to use the framework of cultural hegemony. So this looks at the power relations among social classes of society. Going into gender studies, I was looking at hegemonic masculinity, looking at the cultural dynamics by means of which a social group, here we're looking at gender, claims and sustains a leading and dominant position in a social hierarchy. So this theory has had its critics and rightfully so, every theory does deserve to have its critics, um, but it's been reformulated slightly in the past couple of years. And out of that reformulation came social embodiment. And this is related to professional success in the labor market, which describes the social definition of tasks into either men's work or women's work. And this was a, a framework that I knew I was going to see and I wanted to employ because already looking at that literature review of math is for boys, reading is for girls. Um, so I, wanted, I knew that was going to come up and I knew this framework was going to be the best way for me to kind of understand what was going on there. Now also what was very important for me to understand was the intersectionality. So intersectionality is inter the interconnected nature of social ca categorizations such as race, class, and gender as they apply to a gi given individual or group regarded as creating overlapping and interdependent systems of discrimination or disadvantage. So this was coined by Kimberly Crenshaw. And what this basically means is if you look at me, I'm not just a woman, I am a white woman. And because I'm a white woman, I have different experiences from a black woman. My identity is, uh, patterned on top of each other and you can't separate it from itself. Everybody's going to have different experiences based on their different um, intersectional identities. So moving into my method, I did a series of interviews at a small liberal arts college spanning over six months. The interviews consisted of 10 starting questions allowing for deviation if the need, if the need uh, arise, uh, arose and it did, so oftentimes I did not get through a full 10 questions. Um, it, they would, uh, conversations would often spiral and that was completely welcome. I wanted to make sure I wasn't asking any leading questions that I wasn't forcing my participants to talk to me about something either they didn't wanna talk about or um, give answers that they hadn't, weren't able to form, fully formulate. And participant observation in study sessions and discussions between the community was also a portion of my research. I had a pretty unique uh, experience of being a member of the community that I was looking at, um, both good and bad in this case. I had to oftentimes work with my professors to check my own biases when I was doing this research, um, but it did give me the allowance to be able to talk more freely with my participants. So my participants, uh, over 20 women were interviewed, 70% were in STEM fields and 30 were in fields considered humanities. I also interviewed 10 men. I did not focus on these interviews in my research. However, I wanted to make sure I had a full picture and that I wasn't excluding any voices in this research. They were all college age students, about 18 to 24 uh, from diverse backgrounds and um, all names have been changed as is typical with an ethnography. So I'll start with some uh, quotes from participants um, just before we get into kind of my findings and everything that I found when talking to my participants. So from Sarah, in high school, we had a bunch of job fairs and every time I went to the more science heavy jobs, it felt like I was ignored for the guys around me. From Sydney, I never see women that look like me in places of prestige in academia. And finally from Alicia, I feel like I'm the only one having issues with the material, but I can't speak up. I'm the only girl in class, and if I mess up, it's not just me messing up, you know? 
Um, so, so these were some of the quotes that really stood out to me uh, as I was conducting my research. So my findings from this, and I'll talk in a, a little bit in depth about what a lot of my participants said, but I found that if the, my participants had a parent in STEM, they felt like they had someone to talk to, somebody who had been through what they had been through and understood the comments made by peers, how hard the classes were, and they also had constant reassurance that yes, that science was for them, that they could get through these classes. So I had one participant whose parents were very much against her career path. She was a math major. Uh, she wanted to pursue a PhD in math, but her parents' comments were often about how there were no real jobs for that. Um, it would only put her in debt and how was she going to afford it? So here it's important to notice the intersectionality of this one participant. Uh, she came from a low income family and she was one of the first to go to college. So again, we see that intersectionality play a role where she, her identity played a large role in how she was viewing the world around her. She did not have supportive parents um, and oftentimes felt like she couldn't talk to anyone. So not only was she a woman in STEM, um, but she had to deal with those cultural implications of her family of women don't go to college. Uh, she also mentioned how she was one of two women in her higher level classes and felt like she couldn't talk to the professor because he would think she was stupid, uh, her direct quote. Um, and this was something I saw a lot was the feeling of I can't talk to somebody who is considered above me in academia. Um, I can't tell anyone that I'm struggling was a constant theme. So she also didn't even realize that higher education and math was an option to her. She didn't realize that a PhD was an option until her junior year of college because nobody had talked to her about it. Um, I talked to other math majors um, and they had talked to professors and other students about PhDs as early as freshman year. Um, but she did not know that was even an option. And being one of the few women in this major, she also felt like she didn't have a strong community. Um, she didn't see anyone that looked like her in her major. All of her tutors were men or peers um, going to a small liberal arts school. There weren't many tutors for each subject. Oftentimes your tutors could be uh, classmates that had taken that previous class, but were in other classes with you. Um, and so talking to her, she found her community by uh, joining a sorority. Her sorority, she felt like she could talk to the other members who were also in, some also in STEM and was able to create a community while not directly in her field, um, she still had people that could understand her. And this goes into that finding and theme of if you can find your community and a group of people that look like you and are sharing the same experiences as you, you are more likely to be able to proceed through the STEM fields. Another student, uh, another participant talked about uh, how that I mentioned earlier, she talked about how she never saw any toys that promoted science to her. Um, she, this student actually started an interest in her major geology when her aunt bought her a geology set as a child. Um, and she remembers thinking, but this is for boys. Um, the packaging was all blue. Uh, she remembers this, she remembered this uh, distinctly um, and, but didn't realize this until later in life um, when she finally started to realize and unpack that, that this toy that is just a science toy was marketed toward boys. Um, so here we see that gender stereotyping starting at a young age, like I mentioned earlier. Um, many participants also discussed the concept of imposter syndrome, while sometimes not directly. Uh, I inferred in some cases what they were saying based off of the way they were saying it. Um, but basically they felt like they didn't belong in their classes and that they weren't good enough to be there. Uh, and so I believe that this gender stereotyping um, and the way that we talk about women in science plays a large role in imposter syndrome from what I was seeing. I deduced that the language that parents were using and teachers were using was being internalized by these women and was creating the idea of, I don't see myself as a scientist because I've never heard of a scientist that looks like me. Everybody has told me that men are scientists. So I, I'm not a scientist. Um, and then this internalizes and sort of festers into imposter syndrome as these women were getting older in college. 
And we see this also when my participants were talking about receiving good grades. Uh, one of the quotes was, do I deserve these? Um, and thinking about, yes, which was an odd, uh, an odd experience for me to hear. Because um, obviously these women had worked hard for their grades. They were doing well in their classes, but I was still hearing, do I deserve these grades? Um, and in my opinion, that was that internalized imposter syndrome making the, this woman question whether she belonged in that field. Uh, and some people have come up with the term implanted imposter syndrome, which I also employed uh, for this internalization of identities that are sort of forced on you by gendered stereotypes and negative discourse as a child. Uh, so as, these, as this discourse and as these stereotypes are constantly being presented to you, it is implanting imposter syndrome into these women. Uh, I also found the concept of the independent learner as I was conducting this research. So this greatly affected my participants um, where if they wanted to be considered good in the field, they had to do it without help from professors or peers because asking for help meant that they wouldn't belong. Um, oftentimes it was, oh, I can't ask for help because if I ask for help, then they know I'm struggling. And if they know I'm struggling, they're gonna question about whether I can be here and whether I can do this. And that was a common theme. And I also was seeing a disconnect between the manifestation of STEM talents and appreciation for them with the formal education settings. Um, and this was playing a role into that imposter syndrome. So these women are, were extremely talented in their fields and obviously loved what they were doing, but I was hearing stories of, the, of their formal education where it wasn't appreciating this woman in STEM and this was creating this imposter syndrome. Uh, so talking about one woman who decided to actually leave the STEM field, uh, I found it important to talk to people who had actually left the STEM field so I wasn't just getting a one-sided view. Uh, she was in chemistry and she decided that she didn't want to be in chemistry anymore because it didn't help anyone in her opinion. She wanted to really help people. Um, so she actually ended up switching majors from chemistry to teaching. And the reason she switched and she said was her calling was to help other girls have the experiences she had going into chemistry. Um, so here I found this important to, to keep in mind when understanding that how important mentors are to women and girls in STEM. Uh, and then going on, uh, another participant discussed a chilly atmosphere. So this woman was in engineering and often felt like her male peers did not want her there. She oftentimes um, was the last person selected for group projects um, and oftentimes had conversation with peers um, that were less than positive. In fact, in one uh, person's words, are you just doing this to prove you can do it? So this participant actually mentioned uh, a mentor in her department that ended up um, changing a lot of her views on this. Uh, he pushed for her to continue through with all of the challenges, um, helped her get a TA position and helped her and tutored her personally um, without using uh, the, the tutoring system where pretty much everyone knew who was tutoring who. Um, and so this is showing, this showed to me that with proper mentoring, STEM success can be achieved even with the chilliest of environments. Um, and it does not have to be somebody that looks like you for uh, this mentoring to be successful, although that is extremely important in many cases. Um, so I have hours and hours of interview notes from this and just constantly I was seeing that strong support groups from other women were helping contribute to a positive experience. Um, gender stereotyping was rampant through these women's experience in STEM. Um, there were pressures of being the few women in classes, especially in weed out courses. Um, and imposter syndrome was one of the most common things I saw with all of my participants. Um, the feeling of I don't belong here. Um, so while this is all extremely hard to hear, um, there are things that we can do to move forward. 
So creating social networks, having a space where women and girls can interact with role models at all stages and making sure that these are prominent figures in these fields. Um, seeing someone that looks like you will make a huge impact in your decision to continue forward in STEM fields. Mentorship programs should be occurring at all ages. Um, they should start early. If, if gender stereotyping can impact girls as early as first grade, these programs should be starting as early as first grade to help kind of mitigate those effects. Um, and again, focusing on having mentors that look like student, the students. This is extremely important if you're thinking about the intersectionality of identity on, in understanding who a person is and having a mentor that looks like you is gonna help increase your chances in staying in STEM. And again, in early engagement. So programs for young girls promoting STEM as a career path and even as an option um, at early ages will help mitigate the effects that I was seeing and addressing stereotypes early in these programs, making sure that mentors were checking their implicit biases, that children understood that these implicit biases exist and how to counteract them were all extremely important um, in my research and understanding on how best to move forward. Um, so overall, it was an extremely interesting experience uh, talking to these women and understanding why uh, they decided to stay in STEM or why they decided to leave. Uh, and overall, the biggest issue that I ran into was imposter syndrome. Um, so moving forward, the best way to make sure that women in STEM, at least from my experience, stay in STEM is to address imposter syndrome. Um, so next I have my sources. I have many more sources. If anybody's interested in some of this reading, please just let me know. Um, but I will go ahead and open up to questions. All right, thank you so much, Bren for bringing up this topic for us. Uh, I'm sure you could talk about this for so much longer and we could certainly have hours long discussions, um, but you're right, it's close to the hour. So let's give some opportunity for anyone to uh, discuss uh, from the audience. So feel free to unmute yourselves if you wanted to ask a question or bring up something from your experiences. I will just mention if anybody's interested in some great reading, uh, please just reach out to me and I can provide you with multiple studies and books and papers that are really fascinating and I think can help. I have a quick question. Sure. Yeah, uh, great talk, Bren. Uh, I'm really interested in this. I um, am a co-leader of a, a camp called Girls Exploring the Universe, which is trying to bring in middle school girls to, to not lose them in this leaky pipeline. And one of the things I'm interested in and in having these kind of more conversations about is how to increase our intersectionality. And so I, I might send you an email looking for more uh, <laughs> sources. I suppose I don't have a question, but I'm, I'm interested in your perspective on uh, particularly how to bring in um, these opportunities for non-binary students without making the default, subsuming them into feminine spheres, which isn't the direct answer. Yes. Um, yeah, that is a huge issue and a lot of research is going into right now. Um, in my opinion, I think the best thing is actually sort of getting rid of the binary itself and making sure that all students have access to it, but also making sure that we have mentors who are non-binary, uh, who are women that can be paired directly. Um, I think that plays a large role and also making sure that uh, boys have mentors that may be non-binary in women as well. Um, previous research shows that boys are still going to go on to STEM fields, even if they have uh, women and non-binary mentors. Um, and that can help kind of address that uh, implicit bias early in their young career as well. So if that answers your question, it's, yeah, it's a big question to answer in like a minute. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, certainly there's no, there, I didn't expect like a solution. I just, yeah, uh, yeah. I'm very interested in that conversation. Thank you so much. Yeah, I'd love to talk to you about it further. All right, would anyone else uh, like to ask uh, any question of Bren? Um, we can stay I on. Do for one. Go ahead. I'm Go ahead. curious if you uh, talk to any people about sort of the opposite side of this bias, particularly in education where a student may not feel their teacher is adequate or uh, uh, yeah. Yeah. Uh, um, to help them. 
yeah so i didn't see that come up as much um where they what i did notice in my previous research was if teachers had what was what is coined as math anxiety um where it is internalized imposter syndrome even in just teaching then students are less likely to go into stem so you do see that um, and there's been research done on that, but I didn't look too much into that. Um, again, that was the sort of early career, um, and by career, I mean education um, of students. But yeah, no, that's something I'd have to look further into. Yeah, I know just from my experience in college, most of my professors were women actually, but um, I, unfortunately, I saw a lot of bias from students and other faculty, which was really upsetting. Yeah, you do see that a lot. Um, and it is that gendered stereotype. And you, you can see a form of, re, I don't want to say reversed imposter, imposter syndrome, um, but it is, it's putting your gendered stereotypes on the professor saying because she is a woman she can't she doesn't know this um and i saw that as well in my own classes um so that would be some interesting research that i don't know if there's been too much done but i'm sure there's some hey Bren, thanks for the talk sure. i just wanted to, it's more of a comment really i just wanted to take the opportunity to bring up the idea of mentoring at the observatory um it's something i've at least brought up with various people trying to get some kind of mentoring scheme going here. Um, I feel like everyone should have a mentor or at least the opportunity to have one. Mm -hmm. And um, it's something I'd like to see happen here. Um, hasn't really gained any traction so far, but uh, yeah, I just like to put the idea out there. If anyone would like to get involved in that, I'd like to talk to them about it. And, um, you know, well, it's a very different scheme, but you know, the, the idea of mentoring, I feel in this community, we can play a role in being mentors to younger students, children. Um, but also, you know, I feel like everyone needs a mentor at some level, um, or at least the opportunity to have one. Yeah, no, I think that would be a great uh, thing for the observatory to have. All right, I think it's about time to wrap up, unfortunately, um, but we we can squeeze in one more question if anyone likes to ask something. Um, otherwise, uh, you can get in contact with uh, me or directly with Bren um, with the email that I sent out in the chat. So please um, feel free to keep the conversation going beyond this talk. Um, it's absolutely important for all of us. And um, yeah, so with that, uh, let's thank Bren one last time for coming here. And um, yeah, tune in next week for uh, the next Science Lunch Talk. Thank you all. <laughs>